tonight. Thank you for the joy of the Holy Ghost, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Joy that passes all understanding. Amen. Brother Wilma has been on the schedule for quite some time to preach as our rotation. And uh, they are now pastoring in South Boston, Virginia, doing a great work there, just getting off the ground. Great things are happening. I'll let him tell you a good praise report about this past Sunday. And I uh, told the church Sunday that we're going to be planning a night when uh, our folks come out to benefit there in South Boston. And just a shot in the arm and sing and help uh, pray in, in the altars with people and worship and just be there. Amen. Just to show our solidarity and our support for that good plant. God is doing great things. I believe this gospel needs to be preached in every town. Every county needs an apostolic church. Somebody say praise the Lord. Amen. Doesn't matter if there's 100 people there, if there's 100,000 people there. There needs to be a witness in these last days where the truth is preached. Let's give the Lord a hand as Brother Wilmoth comes right now. God bless you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. We praise you. We praise you, Lord. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Thank you, mighty God. Thank you, mighty God. Thank you, mighty God. Thank you, mighty God. We honor you in this house, Lord Jesus. We honor you in this house, Lord Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. So good to see everybody tonight in the house of the Lord. And we missed last Wednesday night. We were at a conference with our store. We're not, not able to be here. But we miss being, missed being here last Wednesday night. And uh, we thought about the service. We uh, joined in the live stream whenever we could, and uh, uh, love this church, love your pastor so much. Appreciate uh, Pastor and Sister Engel, love them dearly, and they have been so supportive of me and my family, and the work there going on in South Boston, and God has been doing some great things. This past Sunday, we had 19 and three first-time guests. To God be the glory. Amen, amen, amen. We give the Lord praise for that. And uh, people are starting to recognize us around the community there. And so I'm excited. I'm excited about what the Lord is going to do and what He is already doing. Amen. Amen. Um, appreciate my family. Love them so very, very much. And appreciate my wife and kids. And my son, he has... Um, electronic drums there there at the church in South Boston. So when he comes here, well he just turns loose. Hey man, he he likes he, he likes acoustic drums, praise God. But I, uh, he plays with all of his heart. I appreciate him so much. Love my son, my family, my daughters I believe is in nursery tonight helping and uh, love them so very very much. Brother Brian, sister uh, Jennifer was there with us Sunday night and I'm telling you you made you make you would make your pastor very proud, and uh, he did an outstanding job, outstanding job, and I appreciate his ministry so much. We had several people, several people had called me the next day and say, Pastor, man, didn't we have church? They said nothing about Sunday morning, but they said, didn't we have church Sunday night? I said, we sure did. Praise God, it was. It was good. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. If you got your Bibles, turn with me to Lamentations chapter number 3. Lamentations chapter number 3 and verse number 14. Praise God. Lamentations 3, verse number 14. Of course, this is talking about Jeremiah. These are the lamentations of Jeremiah. And he said, I was a derision to all my people and their song all the day. He hath filled me with bitterness. He hath made me drunken with wormwood. He hath also broken my teeth with gravel stones. He hath covered me with ashes. Thou hast removed my soul far off from peace. I forgot prosperity. And I said, my strength and my hope is perished from the Lord. 
Remembering my affliction and my misery, the wormwood and the gall. My soul hath them still in remembrance and is humbled in me. This I recall to my mind. When he began to think about all that was going on and all the pain and affliction and all that was going on in his world. He said, this I recall to my mind, therefore have I hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Pastor, would you pray for us tonight? Amen. And ask God to help us to receive this message in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father, for your word this evening. We pray for the word of God to do what only the word of God can do. Let it penetrate our mind. Let it penetrate our spirit. Let it penetrate our soul, our heart. Cut asunder everything that needs to be cut. Separate the thought and the intent of the heart. Let us leave here better than the way that we came as a result of being exposed to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. God bless you. you may be seated. Tonight when I preached this message, this message may not, you say, it may not fit for me tonight. That's for somebody else. I will say this at the very beginning before I get started, that everybody in this room, at some point in your life, you will need the message that I'm going to deliver tonight. Everybody in this room, at some point, it may not be, to, everything may be going perfect in your world right now, but at some point, you will need what I believe the Lord has for us in this service this evening. There was a famous uh, violinist. His name was Niccolo Paganini. He was standing before a packed house. He was fixing to play a very difficult piece of music. People had come from far and near. They had been waiting for months for the orchestra to gather and the music to be played. It was going to be a night to remember. It was going to be awesome. Paganini gets there, and he is uh, standing there before the crowd. And he picks up his violin. I called Brother Brian today and asked. I said, Brother Brian, can we get a violin? He said, we don't have one. But... Uh, he said, I got an acoustic guitar, so we'll just have to use this as our prop tonight. But a violin has four strings. This is a six-string guitar, but a violin has four strings. He picked up his violin, and he began to play. He took the bow in hand, and he began to uh, rub the strings, and, and music filled that auditorium, and it was beautiful. It was absolutely awesome. People were sitting there in amazement. And uh, at that moment, they realized we have not wasted our money. We've come and we've, we're, we're, we've been waiting for Paganini to play this, this, uh, this music, this difficult piece of music. And man, is he forevermore playing. And then all of a sudden, as he begins to play, one of the strings on the violin breaks. And he kept playing. To the conductor's surprise, man, it just seemed like nothing had changed. He just kept playing the violin. And then, lo and behold, as he's playing the violin, a second string broke on the violin. But Paganini just kept playing. He got a little nervous. He got a little anxious. What's going on? What's happened? I thought I had tightened my strings up. I thought everything was great. I thought everything, man, did I put, did I put cheap? No, I didn't put cheap strings on this thing. 
he had it right. I mean, it was, it was, a, it was, it was an, going to be an awesome concert. People had come. The orchestra was there. Money had been spent. Thousands, yay, thousands of dollars had been spent. And here he is. Two strings had broken. And then all of a sudden, the conductor gasped because he heard the pop of a third string. Paganini, he began to shake. His knees began to knock a little bit, but he just kept playing. He didn't stop. He kept playing the violin. The people were sitting there in amazement. He played that difficult piece of music with that last string. Then all of a sudden, everything stopped, everything, the, the music stopped, the crowd was sitting there, and they realized this is going to be the end. They jumped to their feet. They began to shout. They began to scream. They began to holler, clap their hands. Paganini looked at the conductor, and he said for everybody to sit down. Everybody sat down. They thought, what's, what's going on? There, there's no way there could be an encore. I mean, he's only got one string on the violin. There's no way. What, what is he doing? He's telling us to be seated. And Paganini took the violin and he said, Paganini with one string. And he took the bow and he told the conductor, start the band. And he began to play and he played the fire out of that one string. The people sat there in total amazement. They couldn't believe it. The conductor was even, he could hardly, he could hardly conduct the orchestra because he was watching Paganini and he realized, man, what, I mean, I cannot believe this. He doesn't even have four strings on the violin. He's got one string left and he's playing it as though all four strings are there. And he's playing and he's playing and he's playing. And finally, everybody went crazy. And then, after everybody stopped cheering, he said to the crowd, he raised his Stradivarius in the air and he said, that was Paganini with one string. My title tonight is this, How Will You Play With One String? How will you play? With one, it would have been very easy. The normal thing probably would for anybody would have been taking the violin, putting it in the case, packing his case, and probably marching off the stage upset and mad, angry. I mean, just in disgust. Here I am. What a moment. Thousands of people sitting here. The, the place is packed out, and, and uh, people have come. They've paid money. The orchestra was there. They were ready to back me up and here it is my violin the strings broken I've only got one string left most people would have put the violin up and they would have left and went home but not Paganini Paganini said I'm taking advantage I've only got one string and I'm going to play the fire out of that one string hey whatever I gotta do I'm gonna do it what whatever is before me I'm not gonna give up I'm not throwing this opportunity away I'm not gonna give up on what's before me now I'm going to march on hallelujah 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 amen amen dr. Victor Frankel the bold courageous Jew uh, uh, he was humiliated by the Nazis, and, and uh, it, was, it was a terrible time in his life. And at the beginning of his ordeal, he was marched into a courtroom, and there his captors were before him. He had lost everything. They had taken away his home. They had taken away his family. They had taken away his freedom. They had taken away his possessions. They took his watch. They took his ring. They took everything. They shaved his head. They stripped his clothing off of his body. And there he stood before the court. The German high command under the glaring lights interrogating him and falsely accusing him. He was destitute. He was a pawn in their hand. They were laughing at him. They were making fun of him. He thought to himself, I have lost 
everything. I don't have my family. I don't, I don't even have a wristwatch. I don't have no clothes. My head has been shaved. I have nothing as he stood there in the courtroom. And then something popped in Dr. Frankel's mind in his head. And he said, you know what? They can take everything from me. But there's one thing that they cannot take from me. They cannot take the power of choice of attitude. I'm, hallelujah. They cannot take my attitude. Hey, I'm, it's either bitterness um, or forgiveness. Um, hallelujah. It's either give up um, or go on. Um, it's either hatred um, or hope. Um, it's either determination um, or the paralysis um, of self-pity um, and give up and quit. Um, and Dr. Franco said, I'm not going to do it. Um, I refuse to quit. Amen. And so it boiled down to Dr. Frankel and one string. But he said, I'm going to play the fire out of this last string. My attitude, I refuse to let it go. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We see in our scripture text tonight, Jeremiah. You can see the vivid images of Jeremiah speaking of and what he's going through. He was mocked. He was laughed at. They were singing songs against him and about him and making fun of him. Having to eat bitter herb, herbs, gall, wormwood, the most bitter tasting plant in all of Judah. He had lost everything. Everything had been taken from him. He had nothing. He had no converts. Nobody was following. He was trying to do the right thing. He was trying to do everything right, and here he is. He's getting made fun of, and, 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 and Judah's being punished, and he's trying to help Judah, but he, it seems like he's being punished along with Judah. God's, uh, God's uh, taking judgment out on Judah, and, and it seems like things are going on wrong in Jeremiah's life just, as long, just, just like Judah. He thought, man, what is happening? What's going on? Jeremiah's condition paralleled that of Judah. His outward affliction, his inward turmoil pushed him toward despair. His soul was cast down. But then one thing was recalled to his mind. One thing. I've lost everything. I have nothing else but I do have the power of choice in this situation. Hallelujah. Therefore, I do have hope. When I begin to think about the love of God, when I begin to think about his mercies, when I begin to think about how his compassions, they fail not, and his mercies are new every morning, when I begin to think about the love of Almighty God, hallelujah, if everyone quits on you, you still have God's love. You still have God's mercy. If everybody backs up and says they're not with you anymore, there's still one string you got left to play with. I said there's still one string on the violin. It's my power of choice. God's love. God's love is still with me. I choose God's love. I choose God's mercy. Everybody else may have thrown me away, but God's mercy is still being played. It's new every morning. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. You may be seated. Much like man in the wilderness, the supply could not be exalted. Hallelujah. This truth calls Jeremiah to call out in praise. Great is thy faithfulness. Hallelujah. Jeremiah resolved and said, you know what? I'm just going to wait on God. I'm going to wait for God's restoration. I'm, I'm going to wait for God's blessings. I'm, I'm going to wait for God's help. I refuse to give up in this situation that I'm in. I refuse to quit. Words can never adequately convey the incredible impact of our attitude toward life. I've heard you pastors say it since we've been here. And the longer I live, 
I'm convinced that life is 10% of what happens to us and 90% of how we respond to it. I believe the single most significant decision I can make on a day-to-day basis is my choice of attitude. It's more important than my past. It's more important than my education, my finances, my success, my failure, my fame, my pain, what other people say about me, what other people do, my circumstances or my position. Attitude is that single string, that single string that keeps me going. Or it cripples me. It alone fuels my fire or assaults my hope. When my attitude is right, there's no barrier too high. There's no valley too deep. There's no dream too extreme. There's no challenge too great when my attitude is right. But we have to admit that we spend a lot of time concentrating and fretting upon things that we cannot change. We spend time, instead of playing that one string, we spend time worrying about the strings that's popped on the violin. There was nothing, there was nothing that that Paganini could do about the strings that had broken. He had a choice to make. The only choice that I have right now is to give up Worry about the strings that have broken. I can't change it. There's nothing I can do about it. Or I can play the one string that's still left on the violin. Hallelujah. I'm talking about choice of attitude. There's some things you may be seated. There's some things that we cannot change. Hallelujah. There's some things that we cannot escape. You cannot escape the time clock. It's going to tick away every single day. You cannot change the weather. You cannot change people's actions or their reactions. You cannot change who won or lost. You can't change even delays at the airport. When you get there, you just got to wait. You just got to be, you can't change it. There's nothing you can do about it. You can't change waiting rooms. You can't change um, the traffic that's out on the street. You can't change when the x-ray says this is what's going on. You can't change it. You pray. You can have an attitude, a positive attitude when you get up, but you can't change the results. There's nobody that can go to the grocery store right now and change the cost of groceries. You can't change the cost of gasoline. You can't change the cost of clothes and other things. There's some things you can't change. You can't change um, even the irritations that you have sometimes um, on the job and disappointments um, that come at you of life. The most wasted energy is not when somebody leaves the lights on. The most wasted energy is not natural gas and other things that we may waste I'm going to tell you what the most wasted energy is. is when we fret and waste time about things that we cannot change. And we stand around fighting, trying to contemplate this and that. We waste time when it's time to go on. It's time to move on. It's time to go forward. God is telling us, you can't change yesterday. You must take my mercy and take my grace that I've got for you today. I've been baking it all night in heaven's ovens. My love is fresh today. My mercy is fresh today. My goodness is fresh today. Take what I've got before you and go. Go forward. Hallelujah. Major F.J. Harold Kushner, an Army medical officer held by the Viet Cong for over five years, cites an example of death because of a young man and his attitude. An article that he published in New York Magazine. Among the prisoners in Kushner's POW camp, was a tough young Marine. If he'd have been in the Coast Guard, Brother Lawrence, he'd have probably been tougher. No, I'm playing. Amen. But he was a young, tough Marine, 24 years old, who had already survived two years of prison camp life. He was in good health. He was strong. Everything that the camp commander had asked him to do, 
he had done it and he had cooperated to the T. Since this had been done before others, the Marine turned into a model POW. And the leader of the camp's thought reform group, as time passed, he gradually realized, these captors have lied to me. They told me I was going to be free. They've lied to me. And so, Brother Brian, something happened. Something snapped. He only had one string to play. He was in a war camp. He, he couldn't do anything else. He had one string left on the violin. Kushner said, this young Marine became a zombie. Started laying around. He, he rejected everything. All responsibility. He refused to do it. He laid there sucking his thumb. He wouldn't eat. He wouldn't accept encouragement. Nothing. And Kushner said it was just a matter of just a few weeks in that situation that he took his last, last breath and went out of this world. Because he said, I've only got one string left and I'm going to pack it up and I'm just going to quit. Nothing else I can do. I can't change anything. And so I'm just going to throw in the towel. Caught in the vice grip of lost hope. This young Marine couldn't handle it anymore. And the string snapped. And he went into eternity. How will you play with one string left on the violin? In the letter, the Apostle Paul wrote to the Christians in Philippi. He didn't mince words when he came to attitudes. Although a fairly peaceful and happy flock, the Philippians had a few personality issues that they needed to deal with because it could have very easily derailed them and, and they could have lost momentum and it could have hindered them from going forward. And Paul, knowing this, he said, I'm going straight to the heart of the matter. And in Philippians chapter number 2 and verse 1, the Bible said, if there be... Therefore, any consolation in Christ, if, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Paul let them know if anything was going to be accomplished in Christ, we've got to be like-minded. we got to be together in this thing. we got to be positive in this thing. We can't get up. We can't fight one another. We can't fight yesterday. We got to be together and we got to go on. We've got to have the same love that God has. I ask you tonight, he said, we got to have the same love of God. Same love. What would he do if a sinner walks in? What would he do if a drunkard walks in? What would he do if a murderer walks in? What would he do if Mary Magdalene walked in? What would he do with Zacchaeus? I could go on and on and talk about people in the Bible. We got to have the same love. We've got to be like-minded. It's time for us to be the church. Hallelujah. We can't talk about being the church. We can't just preach that we are the church. We've got to be the church. We've got to be like-minded. We've got to have the same love, same mercy, same compassion, same grace that he extends to people. We've got to extend it. Revival comes when everyone is in one accord. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Amen, amen. Y'all is going to bless Kernersville because of your support of South Boston. God is going to bless this church. He already is. Hallelujah. New people here Sunday. Yeah, man, that's not the end of it. There's more coming. Hallelujah, because I'm going to tell you, this church has, has the same mind as Christ, has the same love as God, because you love everybody. It's time, hey, it's time to love everybody. I said it's time to love everybody. Yeah. 
You gotta be seated. And I'm gonna tell you God's love. God's love pulls people off the shore. And God's love also pulls people out of the water when they fall out of the boat. That's God's love. There may be some that have fallen out of the boat through the years. But I'm going to tell you what God's love does. God said, Peter, come on and get back in the boat. Hallelujah. Come on and get back in the boat. You may have fallen out, but come on and get. Hey, God's love said, hey, sinner, come on. God's love says, hey, there's mercy for those that have fallen out of the boat. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Paul lets us to know um, that we as Christians have the God-given ability through the Holy Ghost um, to put our minds um, on the things that build up, um, on the things that strengthen, um, on the things that encourage, um, on the things that, hey, we got to get, we got to get our lips off each other. We got to quit talking about each other. Hey, Amen. We got to build up each other. We've got to bless each other. We've got to strengthen each other. We've got to help each other. That's the church. That's the attitude of a true apostolic church. <laughs> Hallelujah. You may be seated. Let me hurry. Philippians 2, 3 and 4. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem other better than themselves. Look, not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. We've got a choice. It should never be selfish. Paul said, we should be in the business of helping others. When we take on that mentality, God is going to bless us in return. When we help others, when we love others. Hallelujah, when we have compassion toward others. And then he said in verse 5, Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Paul is dealing with the attitude of Christ, and Christ did not grumble to the the cross he didn't grumble his way oh I wish I didn't have to go to the cross I can't stand these people bothering me these people are aggravating me he didn't grumble his way but the Bible said he humbled his way to the cross we got to quit grumbling and we got to start humbling Hallelujah. I said, we got to quit grumbling and we got to start humbling ourselves. Lord, Lord, I don't understand everything, but oh God, my attitude has got to be right. My attitude has got to be pure. God, I'm going to keep on going on. I'm not going to grumble through this. I'm not going to complain through this. Oh God, whatever you've got of me, I want to do it. I want to do the will of God. I want to do the will of God on a hot Saturday. I want to knock a door. I want to teach a Bible study. It may take some time, but that's all right. Whatever you want me to do, I want to do it. I want to pass out some cards. I want to help somebody. I want to teach a class. I want to help in nursery, whatever I can do. I don't want to grumble about it, but I want to be humble. Whatever I can do, whatever I can do, I want to do it. Philippians 2.14, do all things without murmurings and disputings. The world that we live in is complaining and fussing about everything. Let's be honest tonight. Life is not a bed of roses. But we are the church. And our attitude is, I can get through this. I can do all things. I can make it. As they complain and they say they can't, our attitude is, I can. I will through Christ. I can do this with God's help. Joy is really the underlying theme of the book of Philippians. Joy is used four times. The word rejoice is used eight times. The word glad is used three times. Paul wrote frequently in this epistle about the mind of the child of God. One's manner of life is truly a reflection of what occupies the mind. I'm telling somebody, when you get up in the morning, you can choose to have a hard day or you can choose joy. 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 I choose joy. I choose the love of God. I, I choose the strength of God today. Come on. Baptize us with an attitude and a spirit of joy. Yeah. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God baptized me with a spirit of joy. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hey man, there was a man that came through and he had a large church in California and he came through preaching in our home church years ago. Pastor Ingle will remember and he preached his whole message was joy, joy. He said joy, joy, joy. I mean, he said it probably a thousand times in one message. Joy, God give us joy, joy, joy. And I'm telling you, by the end of that service, that place had blown up. People everywhere. People that were down. Hey, when you start talking about joy, talk about it. Talk about joy. God, give me joy. God, give me peace. Give me strength. Help me tonight. Baptize me with a spirit of joy. Philippians 3 and 1, and I'm hurrying. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Philippians 1 and 4, therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved, and long for my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord. Philippians 4 through 7, rejoice in the Lord always. Always, not sometimes, but always. And again, I say, rejoice. And the peace of God, verse 7, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. We go through things. Our minds have anxiety at times. Our minds, we go through situations. I'm telling you, depression's real. Anxiety's real. Somebody that tells you it's not, they're not telling you the truth. These things are real. We deal with these things. When situations come our way, when difficulty comes our way. I can remember years ago, years ago, and I'm being vulnerable. We had left Durham and we were starting a church. They called my wife. I had left my job. I was trying to find something. I'd been gone several places, about seven different things, and the door was closed on everything. And I didn't have income coming in at the moment. She had the only job. And the boss called and said, uh, we're going to have to terminate your employment. We don't, we don't have the funds. And she said, I'm not quitting. He said, what do you say? He, she said, I'm not quitting. I'm not. I'm going to work. He said, we don't have the funds. He said, she said, I'm not stopping. I'm working today. And I'm going to work tomorrow. And he said, I, I'm not understanding. And I heard him. She was crying. She said, listen. She said, my husband doesn't have a job right now. She said, we're expecting a child. She said, we've got a house payment that we just, we just bought a house. She said, we got two cars in the driveway. She said, I'm telling you that I can't quit work. And he said, Okay. He said, I'll tell you what. He said, figure up what your bills are. He said, I'll pay you to the penny of what it costs you to live. He said, and that's it. You won't have a dime extra. And we didn't. When you don't have money to go buy 89 cent at that time hamburger from McDonald's, it can depress you. And I can remember laying in the bed. My wife coming in there at 2 o'clock in the day, babe. You're going to get up. I don't feel like it, babe. I put the pillow over top of my head. I didn't even want to see the light of the day. You're talking about pressure of your mind. I, I, I tried to go to the post office. And I tried this. I tried that. I tried everything. Every door that I tried was closed. Nothing but the dove would open. It seemed like I went went to one job. I tried to I tried to write parking tickets downtown with the police department. I went down there and had an interview. I called him two or three days later. I said, "Hey, we had an interview. What's going on? Did, you, did I get the job?" He said, "I'm sorry, sir. You're overqualified." He said, "We need we want somebody that's just a senior citizen. We don't want somebody with your kind of energy." I'm telling you the truth. And when you have door after door slammed, I'm telling you, depression and these things are real. 
these things set in. These things, circumstances occur that can crush us. Things in the home, things on the job. But immediately it's in those times that we have a choice to make. We can say, okay, I can choose this path. And joy is back here and peace is back here. And they're ready to put a coat on. They're ready to step up to the plate. They're just listening. They're not going to push themselves. They're not, they're not going to force themselves on you. But when you make the choice, hey, they'll jump at the chance. We'll be right by your side. We'll help you in a moment's notice. All you got to do is reach back and pull out joy. All you got to do is reach back and pull out the peace that passeth all understanding. Hallelujah. Can bring peace to your mind and your heart. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Sit the woman, come, I'm closing down. I've already been too long. You may be seated. Give me just another minute. Philippians 4 and 8. Finally, my brethren, finally, my brethren, whatsoever things, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. We need to put some roadblocks in our mind and say, I refuse to let myself think certain things. I refuse to let my ears hear certain things. My mind is a battleground for my heart and soul and I will not let the devil get a stronghold in my mind and destroy my soul. If you only have one string left, don't let it get out of tune with bitterness. Don't let it get out of tune with anger. Don't let it get out of tune with hatred. Don't let it get out of tune with malice. If you've only got one string left to play on the violin, the devil would love to steal it from you. But you take that violin with one string left, and in the face of the devil, and in the face of the enemy, you play the fire out of that one string. I'm going to play with everything that's inside of me. I refuse to put the violin in the case and be done. Let's stand, please. Back in the 60s, I believe it was, there was a lady by the name of Jody Erickson. She was an athlete. She was an awesome swimmer. Many of you probably have read her story. You've seen her books. And uh, she went to the high dive and she jumped off just like she had done many times before. But this time she came up out of the water differently than before. This time she came out of the water with a broken neck. Loss of feeling from her shoulders down. Numerous operations. Broken romance, the death of dreams, no more swimming, no more horseback riding, no more skating, no more running, no more dancing. Can't take an evening stroll and walk around the block with her spouse. She can't go to the park with the kids and get on the swings and she can't go down the sliding board. There's a lot of things that she couldn't do. All those, those strings of what she could do in the past now dangled off the violin of life. She only had one string left to play. The story goes that she was at a conference. They rolled her out on stage. Everybody was shocked to see that she was the speaker and she was the one that was going to sing the special. There she sat in her wheelchair. She had a radiant smile. She was a rare woman who had chosen not to quit. What is, what is Joni going to sing? What is she going to say? They had the microphone there pinned. She couldn't hold the microphone. It was pinned to her. Her mouth open, 
and her voice, she began to sing. When peace, like a river, attendeth my way. When sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Joni, you've lost everything. You've only got one string to play on the violin. What is your attitude, Joni? What are you going to do? What are you going to sing? What are you going to say? It is well. It is well with my soul. John, you laid your head on the breast of the Messiah. You sat at the feet of Mary. You took care of the master's mother. You were in her house. I mean, you've got so many good memories. Where are you now, John? I'm on the Isle of Patmos. It's hot. The sun is burning me. I don't have anything to eat. I'm shackled. I'm out here. I mean, the ground is burning my feet. I have nothing. John, you're one of the disciples. You sit at Mary's feet. What are you going to do, John? I'm about to have a prayer meeting. I'm about to pray. I'm just about to get in the Spirit. And the Bible said that John got in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And God began to speak to him. And we got the book of Revelation because John had an attitude. I'm going to play the last string on the violin. I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to throw in the towel. This is my lot. This is where I'm at. And God is going to speak to me. And I'm going to write the book of Revelation. And so we get a glimpse in John's suffering in all that John was going through on the Isle of Patmos. We as Christians get a glimpse of heaven because John had an attitude that said, I'm going to play the last string. And I will play the fire out of it. I'm not going to quit. I'm, I'm not throwing it away. I'm, I'm not just going to sleep and die. But God can still speak to me on the aisle of Patmos. Every head bowed, please. Every eye closed. Closing moments of this service. I believe God is speaking to somebody right now. Somebody has come on a Wednesday night. And I know I've been longer than usual. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. But tonight, somebody's here tonight. You're going through a difficult time. You're going through a trial. You're going through a situation and God is speaking to you now. You can give up or you can go on. You can quit or you can pick your head up and joy can fill your soul. The peace of God can fill your life. Hallelujah. God is talking to somebody in the closing moments of this service. Somebody needs to respond and say, you know what? I'm making up my mind tonight. I refuse to give in. I refuse to let the devil have control. I refuse to quit. I'm going to make it. I've got a made up mind to go on. I've got a made up mind to go forward.